Mr. Diakadine. We're going to start by first showing a short video and then we'll tell you a little bit about us and a little bit about our research projects. But first, do you want to say anything about our bowl? This is our mystic bowl. This is the great mystic bowl of the future of higher ed here. Which we find <laughs> answers and we envision and we look into the bowl and we divine the future here about higher ed. And so this is what we're about to do is to work at divining the future and periodically we will have to rephrase this bowl with new fluids of life <laughs> and inform information. And of course that's your responsibility. You'll notice you have on your table, all of you should have a uh, eight and a half by 14 uh, worksheet that you should have on your table that as we go through the, the presentation we will want you to to be filling out we'll talk more about that and you have on the table you'll you have butcher paper and uh, markers and that will be an activity we will want you to help fill into our mystic bowl of the great future of, of higher education and if you don't like either, there's always candy. <laughs> we also, our handout is just the back and front, uh, and we have our URLs that we'll share with you today. So, so are we ready? Let's divine the future. Okay. Dr. Ross. Now, is our future to build pyramids for the next century? If you remember your Egyptians, uh, they built great monuments. Great pyramids, and are we building the pyramids for the next century, or are we looking to our students here and what our students will look like in 2018, i.e. nine or ten years from now?
We'll tell you a little bit about the video in just a minute. About 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, Tweed Ross and I started a, a conversation about technology in higher ed. And we've been having that conversation ever since. One of the first things we did together was we showed school food service employees and directors why they would want to post information on the World Wide Web. And during the course of that meeting with school food service directors, one of them raised their hand and said, why would I even need the World Wide Web? Why would I need a web page? And so Tweed and I have been talking ever since about things like that. Uh, you can see the three of us. I'm Rebecca Gould. Tweed Ross, Dr. Unger will visit us virtually in a little bit. She is in Massachusetts at the time. What we'd like to share with you is about two and a half years ago, Tweed enticed Dr. Unger and I over to his basement with some scrumptious coffee cake. Am I going to get some after this? I've got a new recipe. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, he is the best cook. Dennis, you can answer that. He is the best cook. Okay. And we would sit in his basement, look outside on his fish pond, and we would get mad and happy about higher ed and the way higher ed is going. And interestingly enough, we kind of think the same way, although we haven't always thought the same way because there were reasons that we had boundaries, right? right. Because of positions, director of the Catalyst program, more college ed focused, director of ITAC, more central IT focused, and Dr. Unger, of course, the vice provost for academic services and technology. But once Dr. Unger reti retired and Tweed went on phased retirement, those boundaries went away. And they just brought me along, just so I could have some coffee cake. Um, I make sure. But we always get food wherever we talk. And that collaboration, which we'll talk about through the next uh, few minutes, that collaboration has brought about two national presentations, a YouTube video, papers, and we'll tell you about our papers at the end of this, and it's also brought about this presentation. And so we hope you enjoy it today, and we hope it's a dialogue and a conversation. The other thing we'd like to share with you is we're going to talk about leaders, scholars, uh, faculty like us, IT people like us in the field, and we're going to show you their pictures and talk about all of them as we go along. Some will remember that they're quotes, and some will forget their quotes. So just know that these are, most, these are their thoughts, and we're putting them down for you. Uh, and we have some collective thoughts, which you saw in the video. So let's start. Our first leader, scholar, researcher is Richard Hake. And we searched the web for a picture of him, and Tweed found a 20-year-old. Well, Richard Haig has been retired for many years, so I don't think he's a 20-year-old, and we didn't put his picture up. He was a real hunk, but yeah. Rebecca wouldn't let me use him. Um, and, and what happened in physics education about in the 70s and 80s are they began rethinking the physics instruction process. And all you have to do is think about our two case professors, Dr. Zolman and Dr. Sorensen, and they've employed new ways to teach and learn physics. Then, in about 85, two other physics researchers said that the traditional passive student in an introductory physics course produced minimal understanding of Newtonian mechanics. So what Dr. Haig did is he surveyed 62 introductory physics courses, enrolling more than 6,500 students using a pre- and post-test valid, reliable instrument. And he found that interactive engagement um, showed it enhanced problem solving in their conceptual understanding of physics. So I don't know if any of you have ever taken Physics 101. My husband helped me through it more than 30 years ago because it was the old lecture method. And what Dr. Haig reminds me of is my own epiphany in teaching. And I don't know if any of you have had an epiphany as faculty members, but there's a point where you walk into the classroom and say, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not doing it that way. I'm not being that way. And the joke I tell my students, I used to teach cost controls in hospitality and dietetics. I said, if you sit there, your assets grow larger. Some get it, some don't, okay? And so they could no longer sit there. Oops. Oh, we're supposed to do a presentation. We're supposed to do a presentation. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, the first part of, of your assignment as you work through here, you'll notice the sheets you have here 
Um, I'm hold up on here right quickly. You'll see on here uh, people's names as we go along. And what we want you to do as you think about it is how those folks would relate to changing faculty roles. Uh, how would the pedagogy change? Uh, how would services change? And how would facilities have to change? And what kind of added information? What you'll notice is this is a two-part sheet. This, uh, that's the right word. Carbonless. Carbon, uh, we want you to fill this out as you go along, making notes to yourself. When you get done, we want the yellow one back. You get the white one. And this is, in a way, this is how we want to gain some feedback from you about these folks that we're talking about ideas. As you think about, uh, for example, Richard Hay, what kind of uh, things do they have? I'm going to move on here to uh, uh, Richard Katz. Uh, Richard Katz is president of Educause. I read his book oh, 10 years ago, uh, Dancing with the Devil. By the way, uh, the, the other handout you have lists our resources. For uh, I recommend the book to you very, very seriously. It's a short little book. Uh, I loaned my copy to a person one time. I'll not loan my copy to book to people again because I write in the margins. And they handed it back to me. They said, Tweed, some of the things you have written in the margins are inflammatory and would make people mad. So I can't loan copies of mine out anymore. But anyway, it's talking about the new competition to higher ed. And if we stop to think about dancing with the devil and the new competition to higher ed. Uh, and there's a Great Plains link. Let me just bring the link up right quickly here. You can see that when you get old, you, you have to make really big links because your eyes aren't, aren't so good anymore. And we talk about Great Plains. Now, Kansas State, for example, has always operated on a principle of monopoly, that we have a monopoly to the students that attend our campus. Now start to think in terms of competition between campuses. That, in fact, some of our students might take a course from Nebraska. Uh, how does that competition play out? And then how do you start to put together collaborations in Great Plains units together as, as a a modality for teaching higher ed. What does the faculty look like as you're filling in that blank? What would a faculty member that had a tenured appointment to Kansas State University, but most of his students were in other universities, look like? What would that faculty member look like? And what, well, and what Katz talks about is what we have now is faculty centered. So think about that. What does that mean? Our university, higher ed in general, is faculty centered. What do you think, David? I see you shaking your head. <laughs> So excellence in faculty is what you're talking about. Yes. It, it just can't be your typical faculty member. So what Kat said about future faculty is that we'll have 50,000 content providers. Now think about this. He said it in 1999, so 10 years ago. 50,000 content providers, 200,000 learner facilitators, 
which I think is really what I am mostly when I walk into a classroom, and a thousand faculty celebrities. And you can think about who's our flat faculty celebrity at K-State. You can think about who they are. And whether you believe that or not, that's what Kat said. Um, and will really, in the future, the faculty be more facilitator managers of the learning process? And that gets back to my epiphany of walking in that room and saying, I'm not doing that anymore. I am not going to lecture another day and try another way. Before we move on, I don't, I don't want to rush anybody. One more thing maybe about cats that we should point out is that he said, is it time to unbundle services? So for example, do we sell off part of our full service operation? What do you think that means? Do we sell off something that we're doing at the university that we no longer need to do anymore? Jason. Well, yes. That's okay. So Jason gave the example of disability support services, and do other people provide that in a different way than we do? He also uses the example of the of the police department, and I plumbers, construction, networking, heaven forbid, user support. Do we sell that off and let others do it? And remember, that was ten years ago. Housing and dining is another example. Do we need to continue to provide housing and dining for our students? And it becomes especially relevant as we look at budget cuts and, and the economic climate we're in. I, I think Katz is particularly impactful to me here in the last six months in my role in faculty senate leadership in trying to figure out the budget issues that we're, we're coming to, to deal with and what the university will look like for the students that are are coming here and will be coming here in, as in our little short video in the next eight or nine years. Mm -hmm. We I think that's my grandkids that are in third grade now. Yeah, that's, that's our idea is that in ten years, which was three years ago when we wrote the video, those kids will be here. And are we ready? And are, they, are we listening to what they want? Okay. Can, are you filling out your sheets? <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Assignment. Is, here. is there a coffee cake for them in it at the end? <laughs> okay. Probably not. Uh, Felice Noodleman, she spoke at Sidelight. Sidelight is sponsored by Colleague to Colleague. It's held annually in August or July or August, and it's free. It's a free conference, probably one of the best that I attend in our region related to IT, librarians, teachers. In, uh, people, the networking people, or, or mainly the instructional technology people who handle the classrooms and labs, etc. Felice Noodleman is the executive director of education for the New York Times. And she says that um, the cornerstone of growth and development in the U.S. is education. And I think most of us believe that, and it becomes even more important. But we're being, we have challenges from abroad. China and India are knocking at the door. And any of you, um, and there are going to be major economic forces. And the other thing is that there are increasing opportunities for higher ed outside the U.S., whereas maybe 30 years ago they were not, and not as successful or the quality that they were. She also says that there's going to be changes in the student population, concerns about learning styles, and more mobile community of learners. And we see it all the time. I was at a conference the other day and somebody told me the iPhone was a life-changing experience. And I wanted to say, wait a minute, it's not life-changing, it's a device. I didn't say that. Um, she also talks about that there's a gap in our learning environment. And one, one thing that I love that she said at the conference, she said the next generation of learners will be horizontal learners. Horizontal learning style. And I'm thinking, great. I can learn from my bed, but that's not what she means. <laughs> I can be asleep and learn. What do you think she means? Cross-discipline. There will be cross-discipline. It will not be sage on the stage. These kids aren't going to put up with that anymore. 
And I have an example I want to give to you. Last week I was at our annual conference in Denver at the American Dietetic Association. I loved every single minute of it. The students we were with hated every single minute of it because it was a lecture format. This professor gave the chronology of heart disease from aught from 1900 to today. It was fascinating. They hated every minute of it. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with you? But we, our associations, our professional associations are going to have to prepare in the same way because our students coming will not tolerate the way we're doing business. What we wanted to show you from Felice was the knowledge network and the horizontal learning and that there are others knocking at the door. It could be NPR, it could be PBS, but this is the knowledge network. And I don't know if any of you have seen this. Felice oversees the New York Times knowledge network. And if I wanted to, today, I could enroll in a class. And if I'm doing great at the end of this, California Wines with Eric Asimov. And I just wanted to show you how inexpensive it is. $125. It's one week. The live webcast is on one day for $125. Now, I might not get CE credits and I might not get graduation credits, but there are others knocking at our door. And you know what? There are a hundred others that are free. And Tweed looks at those every single day. I mean, iTunes U, you can go for free. So anyway, that's the Knowledge Network. Where, where would a <coughs> University of Phoenix fit into this arena? It would be more like us, don't you think? The only difference is there's many online as well as face-to-face. -face. And it, has, it, has it earned the level of respect that a four-year or, or graduate university would have? It's growing. What do you all think? Is, is Phoenix, University of Phoenix, earning the respect that our, our university might? There's an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education, I think it's today, about them taking back, uh, they, about four years ago, there was a major lawsuit with regards to how they were treated. Uh, and it talks a little bit about how they're earning back that respect in most other institutions nationwide. How students do perceive it on par with the four year institutions. And, and my amusement epiphany about that is how many pro football stadiums are named after land grant or D1 football universities? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, never mind. <laughs> They are tied in very much into the power structure. They're the ones who define what's true and what's not true, right? That's what journalists do. And when you talk about horizontal learning, you're talking about prosumer-created content, people who are on the street who create their version of the universe. So how do these two concepts <coughs> come together, in a sense? You know, I mean, how do you know what information to validate Good question. You have to have a very discerning individual. That's um, and these New York Times Knowledge Network is very careful about who they include. If if you look, they don't include. Um, I looked through most of the examples the other night, and, and they're reputable universities. So that's why you have to be discerning. I mean, you can learn with a columnist from the New York Times. That's more expensive. I think that was a thousand dollars. But think about writing fiction and having a New York Times columnist. columnist read my work. Would this be something like selective degree creation? It could be swirling. It could be you pick from here. But this isn't what this is necessarily for. This right now, it's in the early stages and this is more continuing ed, um, lifelong learning, etc. Oh, lifelong, lifelong learning. This is more like that for right now. But we'll show you another one, maybe not. Okay? Good questions. Okay. All right. Oops. That's all. Uh, Chris Deedy has been one of the eye-openers in, in my experience that I've, I've bumped into. And, and Chris Deedy talks about disrupting the traditional classroom. And what he talks about, really, is disrupting events. I'm going to go ahead and start. The, uh, it's a Vimeo, and it's... It's a, it takes a down, long time to download, so I'm not going to even try and download the whole thing and play the whole thing. But I really recommend that you go to it because he's, what he's talking about is, is computers as, as a disrupting event. 
as an event that turns everything over, that you can't, uh, you can't go back from computers. Just like, and, and I've always used the analogy, once we went to the printing press, you couldn't go back before books. And he's talking about how it disrupts the traditional classroom. And, and we've seen this in no ends of cases of, of, of uh, I think the biggest case is, is Wikipedia. Now we can like Wikipedia or not like Wikipedia. It doesn't make any difference. That is the source of information for many of our students. It's a source of information for many of us. I, I was looking for something quick and de dirty uh, uh, yesterday, and I always figure the knowledge I get from Wikipedia, I always call it, I'm, I'm, is Wikipedia deep, which means it's pretty shallow. But when, when I want something quickly, that's a place to go. And if I recognize it, and it's disrupting, it's no longer do I call up somebody or find somebody, I now have access to it. And I, I can always remember in my same way, um, long ago when I could see no value to the web. I honestly couldn't see any value to the web. When I first saw it, I thought, this, this goes nowhere. I mean, and now, you know, to you whiz. Uh, I've not always been right. My crystal ball hasn't always worked. But at the same time, in these disrupting events, look at these things. Uh, we talked a minute ago about iPhones. The next time you walk out of a campus building, as you leave here, See what students are doing. I'm willing to wager if we do a research on campus, more than half of them walking across campus will have earbuds of some sort in their ears or they're talking on their cell phone. And the one I, I was just most interested in is Rebecca and Beth and I and some folks from KU were out to lunch. Oh, what was this a year ago, Spring? We're sitting there at lunch and, and having lunch, and there's four students sitting at a table over there, carrying on a conversation with each other, all of them, at the same time of their conversation, going like this, chatting with somebody else. I mean, talking to somebody else, communicating with somebody else. I'm, I'm just boggled. I mean, here they are with four of their friends. This is disrupting. It totally uh, changes. The game has changed. It won't unchanged if I look at it that way. Yeah. See if that sound comes up. Kind of muffles. But I recommend that, that you look to it. Chris Deedy uh, uh, teaches up to Harvard now. I'm going to stop that because the sound's just a uh, Teaches up to Harvard and, and talks about disrupting the classroom. How many of you have had students listening in your classroom to an iPhone, a cell phone conversation, looking at their laptop, whatever? All of us? None of us? Show of hands? I okay. used to, but not anymore. <laughs> Pardon? I used to, but not anymore. I punished them. <laughs> you punished them. <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, one of Dennis's and my big thing we have to figure out in the next two years, I think, and I think we have a short time frame, is how we are going to get enough 110 electricity in our classroom to power laptops during the course of the day. When I think of a facilities issue, I simply do not have enough 110 plug-ins in the classroom for the laptops that are coming in. And I mean, I put those into the facility issues call. What am I going to do? I don't know. I'm going to leave that to Dennis. I'm on phased retirement. <laughs> I eat. I'm going to be out of here. But it's, it's a problem. Our students come in. They need to power up laptops. If I could figure a way to make a 16-hour battery, trust me, I would be in retirement and making big donations to the foundation. <laughs> what? Yeah, but I can't figure out how to make a 16-hour battery. <laughs> so, so think about the disruption. What does it disrupt to, to faculty members? Once again, what, is, what does the faculty look like? If I can have Chris Deaney give a lecture to my class, do they need me? What's my role? What's his role? 
I don't know. Questions? Speak up. Oh, I thought you had a question. I just had a comment, but I mean, Chris Deedy is not going to speak to everybody. Chris Deedy is going to speak to some people, and some people are going to be receptive to his ideas. Right. But you're not going to have gurus that totally connect with everybody. There's going to be all kinds of needs. And there's something about an embodied person okay. that, right. at least for me, is motivating. Okay. About to say, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm a firm believer of, of what I call breaking bread with people. You know, I'm a firm believer in that. But I also know that I'm probably not the best historical lecturer in, in the United States. And I know people that are much better than I that could do that. So what's my role? If breaking bread, as I described, sitting down with you and talking with you, but I can get a great somebody else to deliver the content in ways that really are much better than me, what's my role become as a faculty member? <laughs> I've got a great new recipe. But <laughs> David. Well, at the very least, you are the facilitator who's choosing to put Christy on a classroom. But in addition to that, I think it largely depends on what happens to the culture. I mean, if the technology so disrupts the culture that face-to-face um, -face communication is not motivating and not desirable, but the best way to communicate is interactively using some device facilitating communication. You can't stop that. That's the runaway train. If people actually say, I don't like interpersonal communication, it scares me, or it's threatening, or uninteresting, then uh, I guess the question is, do we want to teach people to have other experiences in school? Does that become part of the curriculum? You know, new way styles of communication? Or do we not value it so much that we decide, no, actually, they're right. We have to become more like them. Hmm. Excellent. What does Good. the curriculum become? That's that's kind of our question. What's the pedagogy and the curriculum become? Absolutely. What's uh, obviously the uh, I'm Justin Weepers. I work with 4-H Youth Development. Uh -huh. um, at a conference that we had this summer, we knew you know we had 600 kids coming in. We knew they'd be bringing cell phones. We actually encouraged it this year. Uh -huh. we said bring your cell phones, bring them to class. You're welcome to have them there. Make sure that the ringers are off. But there's going to be times we're asking you to use them. We used a new system called uh, Poll Everywhere. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And we actually engaged them using that, so instead of a distraction, it became a necessary tool, and for them to participate, they would they would actually use that tool not as a distraction, but then as a contributing, uh, engaging factor. So we thought, rather than try to fight it, let's let's try to put it to an educational use. Absolutely. And that that was really exciting just to have have chaperones and adults say, "You want them to bring their phones." <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I think there's. Uh, so where am I going? Related to the horizontal learning that right. teacher and students in exchange information, where they found you know, my the benefit I can think of for my class is um. I mean, I would still let them use their laptops or cell phones in my classroom until I can monitor while I'm mm. talking. You know, oh, when I'm using material from the web. I still do not, do not have access to their you know, terminals, right? Their, what, sc what screen they are opening, right? I don't know. So, so I, don't let, I wouldn't let them, but the benefit is they can come to class prepared also. They will do all the research about the subject or topic of the day and then bring it, you know, and share with the class instead of me lecturing or providing all the information, do all the web search, you know, to give them more information, you know. Mm -hmm. So it will reduce my workload a little bit. And you know my you know shoulder will be a little bit lighter, you know, and then I will um, you know uh, listen to them more. You know, I'm not a I'm a poor listener, but I'll try to listen to them, you know, better. Mm. So, so it's kind of a horizon to learning. I was thinking. Yeah. I was going to kind of say the same, uh, a similar thing in regards to horizontal uh, learning, but I don't think of it as changing the pedagogy of the classroom or changing even the speaker. I see that person being the same, but just kind of enhancing it with a different type of communication in many classrooms where get the students to pull up the laptop. I have a hard time writing on this. I have my laptop up ready to go before I saw these. Um, and just changing the, the, the method of communication and enhancing it, bringing in outside information and allowing students to create their own learning style, mm -hmm. to interact with that in-person in -person speaker. Because I agree, I think that in-person speaker, whatever you want to call it, definitely a necessity. Mm. I think it's, it's a way to increase learner autonomy 
because actually what they would be doing would be um, managing their own um, learning and adding that to what the others are experiencing, giving them much more of, um, input and feedback and, and a volume of exchange um, that would be very valuable to the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So that it wouldn't be just a one person frontal exchange, but it would be a circular uh, kind of uh, exchange that would be much more fruitful. Hold that thought. We're going to come back to this. Believe it or not, we re we really will. We pro I promise. Then we come. Related to the disrupting part, you know, not only in classroom, I get disrupted in my own, you know, laptop, you know, while I'm doing my hope, my, my, you know, writing paper or research. While I'm researching, I get distracted by other information available there, and I have control issue really. So. I really need help with that. I, I think my students will have more trouble than me, you know. Oh, probably. So, That's you know, how are we going to control that, you know, account for that, you know. So. That's a very good point, and maybe it doesn't matter. Really? I yeah. Then I usually waste a lot of time remotely related material, that's because it's more fun, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I think we know about two airline pilots. That, that's uh, what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> was it really a laptop? <laughs> Shall we say are unemployed, I think, this morning? <laughs> Uh, well, Rebecca, one more, maybe, okay. and then one more. really move on. I was just thinking of uh, being distracted. It's like looking up a word in the dictionary. When you look up a word in the dictionary, you see other words. And what's wrong with that? It's yeah. very possible. Yeah, that's, that's a very, those are all good points, and that's why we want you to be thinking about this. That's why we're here. Okay. David Wiley, I think Shasti and Tweed and I and Beth heard him speak last year at the eLearn conference in Las Vegas. David Wiley is known for his vision around the open content movement. And he was really big early on in making sure that licensing and attribution was handled. And then somebody else came along and, and really made it work with Creative Commons. But a couple of things about David Wiley. He believes that content should be shared, that we don't have to contain it, we don't have to put it behind an EID and password, that we should share it with the world. Think MIT, open courseware. But that's his point. And he gives the example, there's a great video, if you Google him you'll find it. And he talks about, 10 years ago he was creating a website and all he wanted to do was put a website, I mean a calculator on this website so that then it could be shared on the website and it brought him back to grade school when there was one calculator to be shared in elementary school. And it got him to the point of sharing. We need to share and I mean he's all over it. Um, and he gives many reasons for sharing and open content and one term that he uses he uses the term remix. So you take this open content and you remix it. Think about your mixer when you remix music. Well, Tweed and I and Beth use the word swarm. So we say what we've done right now is we've taken all these individuals and we're swarming. And we're forming some kind of meaning about what these people say. But you might take these same individuals and re-swarm and make it into your own and something different. And he thinks we should share it. And I truly believe that. Let me just read a quote from what he says in, um, in a newspaper article. David Wiley says, Higher education doesn't reflect the life that students are living. In that life, information is available on demand, files are shared, and the world is mobile and connected. Today's colleges, on the other hand, are typically tethered, isolated, generic, and closed. End quote. It's David Wiley. And we're just going to show you a few examples. There are a hundred more. For people in K-12, through 12, I don't know if you've seen curriculum.org. Curriculum.org, let me look at my notes just a minute, it has 90,000 members, 32,000 resources. And you could go in there and look for, say you wanted to give a biology or a chemistry lecture. There is information in curriculum.org on that biology lecture, and this is for K through 12. Open content. Can you imagine the wealth of information available to teachers to make their classroom lectures, teaching come alive? So that's curriculum.org. There are others, Open Source Consortium, if you haven't looked at that, ocwconsortium.org, 3,700 3, courses in six languages from 43 sources. 
I looked, I'm a big fan of British literature, it was my favorite course in um, higher ed. It's there. And opensource.org, their tagline is, the world is open. There's magnitudes.com if you want free content, um, if you want free music from artists from around the world. And then... I don't know if you've seen this. This is one of my very favorite. And you could get moving pictures from the internetarchive.org. You can get movies. You can get live music. The Grateful Dead from 1971. I can be a deadhead and not have to go anywhere. Um, audio. And you can get text. I have a hard picture of you as a Grateful, Grateful Dead. Dead. A deadhead? <laughs> my picture here is <laughs> You don't see me as a deadhead? No. Okay. Well, then, then, a, then a better example that you could hear JFK from 1961 give his inaugural address. It's quite moving. It's about 14 minutes. And all you have to do is find it on the web and put it in your course. The other thing I like about this website is if you want to see how far we've come, you can look at the Wayback Machine and look at the progression of uh, web pages from when you started to now and what they look like. And K-State, trust me, looks really interesting from the very beginning. I, I think we all know uh, Michael and his, his sense of purpose, uh, which we're, we're just fascinated by here and his work. And if, if you haven't seen his YouTube videos or, or heard one of Michael's uh, things, you start to understand what's going on. And the reason why I just say a sense of purpose podcast, because now we start to think about mobility, not just looking at a YouTube video here, but now, video casts and podcasts, I, I was flying back from New York over the weekend watching somebody watching uh, uh, on a, a netbook, watching a lecture. I don't even know what it was, but he was in the seat uh, across the aisle from me, uh, a young student flying back to Kansas City, and he's sitting there watching somebody's lecture. But it's the mobility issue that is now coming into play, that the whole walking across campus, walking across in your dorm, reviewing it, re-looking at it, uh, and having a purpose to do it. We all know that students learn best when they have a purpose for learning that. I mean, and if, and if I'm saying they're delivering a, an HPA lecture and they don't have the purpose yet, it doesn't go anywhere. But when you have the purpose, then the lecture makes sense. Then it starts to fit. And if they can look at that and listen to that as they walk across campus with, with uh, their iPhone or what are some of the newer brands? Uh, Palm Pre. You know, Palm all of these kinds of, of things. Uh, my, my favorite example right now, and I suppose most of you know or don't know that I'm the iTunes guy, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. I, I'm a, a, an avid fan of, of iTunes U. I, I'm not ashamed about that. But I, I'm sitting, I listen to, to lectures from Stanford. We talk about the credibility of faculty. Now, if I want to, to get a lecture on, on biblical historiology, who do I go to at K-State's campus that's top of the line there? Nobody? I can, I can get the Stanford lectures delivered, and I won't bore you with them this morning because I don't think anybody really is interested in that. But I can get them, I can review them, I can listen to them in multiple times because, you know, that's tough work. <laughs> it's tough understanding. But it's mobile. I drive across western Kansas, I drive to Kansas City. I'm trying to digest this, this stuff because I have a sense of purpose to that now. And I don't have the credibility, you know, because we don't have a school of theology at K-State. You know, because you know, that's just something we don't have. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by this whole concept that, that's starting to, to develop around students and having a sense of purpose. 
to what they're doing and what they're learning. Comment? He, he talks about having students join him on the quest for learning. And if you read anything about him, he talks about significance and relevance, and he uses those words over and over. Um, he also asks about asking the right questions, you know, not uh, what do I need to get an A on the test. That's literally what did me in, why I applied for the ITAC job, is because I had one too many students ask why didn't I get an A. That wasn't what this was about. It was about critical thinking, deeper issues of our time. The other thing he talks about is the environment in which students learn. And in this anti-teaching article, he talks about Umberger 105 without saying Umberger 105. Oh my gosh, if any of you, we'll show you a picture of Umberger 105 in a minute. It's 483 chairs, all neat in a row. You face a stage which no faculty goes, dares to go. Um, the carpet is terrible, the acoustics are terrible, and Tweed calls it distance learning. Um, I, I think somewhere they're two zip codes away from the back to the front of Umberger. You, no. you cannot reach the student in the very back row, and all disability support for students is in the very back row. It is a nightmare, and we're trying to rethink it. But he talks about, he says, chairs in a neat orderly row facing a massive stage. And he says the room is more about efficiency, expediency, and credit hours, and less about learning. Whoa, because our group handles tech classrooms, that was a wake-up call. And that's in his article, Anti-Teaching. And, and think... Uh, how many of you been to Umberger 105? Has everybody seen been it. there once? Do you know in what while? we're talking about? Have, have you sat in a lecture in 105? Okay, there's a there's a field trip for you. <laughs> I think I think faculty should all go sit in. Uh, pick the most dynamic subject you can think of, and go to 105. And sit there. And, and take your collegian with you. Yeah. And I will almost wager you, halfway through the lecture, you'll be reading your collegian because you will not connect. Ernie will take you on a tour, weren't you, Ernie? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I can see why he's talking about that particular room, but, but that is, is not really related to technology. It's more related to the size of class. That's right. right. So, so, that's but, right. And, and, large, yeah, large lecture class is a problem anyway. You know, so yes, that's a very good... What about him doing that in the real class, then technology would be that relevant, you know? That's and, right. And his That's example, he uses uh, the room in my building, Blue Mont 101, which is what, 150 students? Almost two. 200? 189. Yeah, almost okay. 200. Yeah. Okay, so Michael Wish. Okay. And, and he, the Sense of Purpose is in Educause, October 2009. Mm -hmm. Educause, really good article and podcast, very short and to the point. We have Mark Taylor. He's chair of the Religion Department at Columbia University, and he's really edgy. And we're going to have to read... This one you won't like. This, this one, we're going to have to read some of it. Because it, I mean, it speaks to me. Impose mandatory retirement and abolish tenure. Wouldn't that get us going? Um, he says tenure was intended to protect, protect academic freedom, but has resulted in institutions with little turnover and professors impervious to change. And I don't believe that about everybody, but... Um, once tenure has been granted, there is no leverage to encourage a professor to continue to develop professionally or to require him or her to assume responsibilities. And he's, he's predicting uh, the end of the university by, what, 2020, I think. Or that's, that's Wiley says 2020. But he, the other thing he says is tenure should be, be replaced with seven-year contracts. And at, the, at some point in the seven-year, you go back and renegotiate, review, um, and determine whether that person's going to continue or not. Have they evolved? Have they remained productive? And are you making room for new people with new ideas, new skills, etc.? Okay, it'd be interesting to see how many of us at K-State have tenure and for how long and how productive we really are. Okay. Um, the other thing you'll appreciate, and especially in our budget time, he says abolish permanent departments. How about that? Let's put that on an article. Even for undergraduate ed and create problem-focused programs. The constantly evolving programs would have a sunset clause and every seven years each one should be evaluated and either abolished, continued, or significantly changed. <laughs> I like the look here. <laughs> what do you think, Jason? Well, uh, there's been some topics kind of coming up with different colleges joining across the country, um, colleges that 
typically aren't seen as having much in common to save money. Yeah. And I guess I think of that, and you know, colleges have done pretty well with that, and in ways that people were really shocked. So maybe it's not such a big deal. As an English major, I'm scared. As an English major, and maybe it's not so far fetched. Yeah. You know, art, art and history, art and English. Yeah. But do you have to? If it's problem based, were you going to say something? I'm just curious where he's picking up the seven year number. I don't know. It's just an odd number to pull out of the air. Think about he's from a religion department. Yeah, I'm going to say probably go with flags <laughs> and uh, some other things, I would guess. Biblical. <laughs> yeah. Mine may be 40. Yikes. I see different curriculums having different cycles. I mean, some fields turnover probably needs to be in a shorter cycle and mm -hmm. other fields things change very slowly so it may not be as relevant but um, and I think that would actually be more useful to make it more dependent on on what's actually being done in that field or those problems versus just an arbitrary number out of, yeah. out of the wild I, I suspect it was a number to, for shock value mm -hmm. uh, I really do. but the, the point that, that to have fixed departments that never change that are never reviewed, uh, I think is, is the essential uh, uh, gist of, of Mark Taylor. There's, there's a problem with fixed numbers in general. Good, numbers. good point, good point. I mean, every time I start helping someone build an online course, they're stuck in this 50-minute lecture rut, mm -hmm. which has no relevance to anything other than a line schedule somewhere. That's right. It, it doesn't, it doesn't depict what they're teaching, it isn't broken up in reasonable chunks of information, it doesn't help students learn better, it doesn't help them teach better, there's no meaning in it. But they're really married to that 50 minute time slot and it's hard to get them to re-envision the way they're teaching and thinking about teaching and learning. Well, even to the point, I think that there's some sort of university or board of regents rule that a three-hour course meets for 45, 50-minute periods a semester. I think that's defined in minutes, but how does that apply to an online course? Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I, I've had this discussion with my department head. How do you know that they're spending whatever is 40 times times 50 minutes on? I said, I don't. And does it matter? And does it matter? Often students are spending that 50 minutes like an hamburger. I spent my 50 minutes in hamburger sleeping yeah. regularly. It was 12.30 class. They dimmed the lights. Half of us were out. <laughs> I can barely remember anything from that class other than the fact it was a good place to catch an after lunch nap. You're kind of drowsy. Ate too much for lunch, yeah. I may regret having this on camera, but I'm really intrigued with his idea of, of you know, cutting, putting sunset dates. And, and maybe, you know, you could look at programs and departments that, yeah, this one's got a long history and a long longevity. We put a longer sunset date on that, but shorter one. seems like that would really keep us accountable. That's, that's, yeah, whether it's seven or ten or whatever, yeah, rev us up a little bit. You know, put some fire under our furnace. Let's, let's rethink this. And the other part of that, that was that we're doing this idea we're doing that in commercial buildings in particular you know think of you know when they build a church now it's out of steel building ten side <laughs> so that it can be knocked down and rebuilt and, and enlarged or modified or changed quickly and more cheaply we're doing it with buildings it just seems like that could could lead to higher ed hmm. no, the, could. take off from a piece here though that reminds me of something you like a call every so it was meant for a very short limited time and it's been used now for 50 plus years I think of, um, in thinking about that though, are we bypassing the student needs in this regard and not thinking about their curriculum changes? Are we through a program all of a sudden the faculty you know, who might be gone from a major program, their, their curriculum may change considerably? Mm -hmm. Would we be following maybe the wrong trends and are we not paying enough attention to student development? So, so it goes into filling in that kind of curriculum blank. What would that curriculum look like? Mm -hmm. Memory, what would happen to institutional memory, what would happen to research. Expertise takes at least a decade to build if you look at the research on, on expertise. You know, I mean, people go into the field with a long time frame and they're willing to, to accept a lot lower pay in academia because of some of these protections so they can develop certain concepts. And sometimes it takes decades to really come to fruition. 
terms of, of research. What happens to apprenticeships? We have got new faculty coming in and you have more seasoned faculty trying to, tra to train them into a profession. I mean, there are huge implications mm -hmm. that aren't addressed with the idea of focusing here just on fresher teaching methods, but a lot more happens at universities beyond teaching. And I think that also has to be So that goes into the Block. <laughs> That's not the right word. Okay. The, uh, he, just a few other things he talks about is that all institutions don't have to be all things to all people. Could you get French here, German somewhere else? And that's around the same idea as the Great Plains. And there are other examples, but we need, we need to move on. Yeah, we'll okay. just very quickly, we won't say much about Michael Crow. Michael Crow is probably one of the most innovative presidents in the country. He's at Arizona State. He has really shaken shaken the shook <laughs> he's just shake rattled and rolled the um, Arizona State University and if you haven't read about him go on to the new American University and look at the quick video he have he has eight design aspirations for ASU and they have changed incredibly since 2002 just an amazing man um, can, you, can you read those from from there uh, uh, leverage of place, transform society, value under, conduct use inspired research, enable students. Can you read those? Uh, they're engage globally. So please go. Globally. Yeah, please. And, 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 and as we're working through these current budget issues, I think this, in some ways, pro provides a framework for us to think about what K State will look like mm -hmm. uh, in 10 years, 15 years. You know, and, and it, I think uh, Michael Crow's put together uh, a, a schema, if that's the right mm -hmm. word I'm looking for, to do that. So I we recommend that very highly. Okay, and yeah. then I, we need. Uh, yeah. We're running out of time. I told Robert this was going to happen. And I told him it wasn't. <laughs> you, you win. Do I still get coffee cake? So is this our future? One student sitting in a great big room. This is from the economist. the economist, and it's the future of higher ed, how technology will shape learning. And there's there are lots of research in it. They researched over 289 individuals, both from corporate and higher ed. One thing that got me is there was a question, how well prepared do you feel your country's university and college students are to compete in today's global marketplace? And the responses were one to five, with one being well prepared and five being not at all prepared. It, and when the question was understanding of international issues, 45% said four are not at all prepared for global issues. And you could think about our provost lecture yesterday talked about our presence. We have a presence in China to encourage students to come here. But are we really understanding what we need to help these students in a global world? And the one that I really love about this article is at one of the very end it says, perhaps the most critical question facing the academic world is more fundamental. And the question is, what will it mean to be an educated person in the 21st century? And we're talking about really um, messing up the apple cart here. Now we want to move on. Our co-conspirator, Dr. Unger, is going to speak to you in an audio format. We hope. We hope. Uh, next. One more. And is it loud enough? It's a real privilege for me to participate in this discussion, but the lack of interaction uh, means that some of the repartee that goes along with the controversial issues that I will put forth today may be missed. So I do hope to have profit with some of you to forge these ideas into a platform for the future of education and how Kansas State University will respond. There are several perspectives that have been put forth during my service the last two years at APLU, which is the old and the We're going to move on. Just Higher education is going to change to adapt to the smallest of our world and to the technology that created this global world and then to the grand challenges that our world provides. The only question is who is going to determine the change path for these universities. Second, 
Our nation needs to meet the current and future challenges to our economic prosperity and to our influence in the world. Our graduates will need to have the skills to operate in the global world and to do it almost immediately upon graduation. What does this mean to us as a, a university and as a set of faculties? Our institution needs to respond and be a major player in the decision making that goes on in our region and in the world. What does this mean to K-State? Well, this latter one we've discussed extensively in the APLU committee and one way we're coming to is to be an important and sought after partner in the economic development in the region in which the university resides and then to have our students participate in meaningful ways in the resulting economic organizations. <clears throat> APLU's discussions have been far-ranging, but focus now on just two things, producing scholars that can deal with the challenges of this global and technological world, and second, participating in the efforts to make the U.S. more innovative and competitive. These two issues impinge on the public perception of our institutions and on the accountability of publicly supported institutions. First, there is a considerable belief that the rigid disciplinary organizational structures we currently have in our universities are holding back the formation of dynamic groups of faculty members to teach and to do research in the challenge areas. Interdisciplinary programs and new colleges have been two responses to these uh, challenges. Interdisciplinary programs have been successful and unsuccessful and those that have succeeded seem to have been the ones that have the reward policy in place for the individuals and a policy for group dissolution and uh, reformation that is fair to all. New colleges have been an approach taken by several universities. In fact, Arizona State University has several new colleges. They are combinations of disciplines from the old colleges and you might want to take a look at their website. The questions that really arise in this are, are the fundamentals of the current considered foundational material being taught and how does one evaluate a person with one of these new degrees and again in terms of the groups how do you morph these groups into something new on a dynamic basis? The second issue is faculty. There is some belief that the concept of a faculty and a faculty member will change over time in the way suggested as necessary are the following. Let's start with the faculty. A faculty will most likely consist of members from a number of different institutions which some consider the Homer-based faculty for the institution in which they reside. Most faculty members will then hold partially, partial appointments in more than one institution. There will be para-faculty members who many do the work, routine work of the faculty, an extension of the concept of the professional advisor who do today most of the routine work of advising. We may find that our faculty members consist of others from different sectors of our economy, in particular business, industry, and the government. These faculty members, <coughs> why whatever title they have, will have to be considered equal members of the faculty in terms of respect and knowledge. Residence on the internet for a faculty member will become much more important than it is today. The concept of tenure may be eliminated and replaced with long contracts, say seven years. Faculty members most likely will be organized into disciplinary group, groupings at their home institution or at other institutions where they are partially employed. The questions that arrive involve the proper organizational structure, 
policy and procedure for the evaluation of faculty across many disciplines or who work at many different institutions, the benefit structures for these individuals, and of course there's the question of allegiance of the faculty to the institution, to an institution. Third, innovation and regional economic prosperity is important as a response to the public's demand for accountability of our public institutions of higher education. Our instant gratification society wants more visible ways in which the universities are helping them. This arena of endeavor means that the university becomes a meaningful partner, not just a producer of research as we've done so well, or prototype products, or patents, and we have become a fertile place for incubators, but we are expected to become full-fledged partners in the formation of groups of influence to create opportunities for the region. The work of this group will be documented on the APLU website by late November. In closing, let me remind you that our former provost, Dr. James Kaufman, spoke of the train racing down the track. He did this more than a year ago, or more than a decade ago. The train, more interactive learning and mediated distance learning was to be part of the instructional process to improve it for our students. As an institution, he challenged us to either get out of the way or grab onto the train. As an institution, we responded in our own way. I urge you now to discuss the issues of this decade and respond in a way that is best for our institution and for our region. Thank you. It's been a great privilege to be able to speak with you. So, back to your question. Is this our future? What room is that? Well, that's Umberger 105. That's why we... Is that our future? Is that the future we want to have here? And should we pump a million dollars into renovating that room? That's what it will take. At least 750000 right now, so it might as well be a million. Okay. It's as well. I mean, what's the difference? I mean, is this K-State's future? Yeah. The other... Or is... Go ahead. The other thing we'd like to share with you is there are a hundred other resources we haven't even talked about. ECAR just came out with a great study of undergraduate students and their use of IT uh, just last week. It's fascinating. Two million minutes is follows high school students around via video and watches what they do. Fascinating work. Save the World is Stanley Fish, Diana Oblinger with Educause. Uh, we haven't even talked about what she says. I'm running down the hall last week saying, Tweed, we forgot Henry Jenkins at MIT. <laughs> Tweed. We couldn't talk about them all. Um, the Horizon Report, and one that we really think everybody should look at is the new Bloom's Taxonomy. Tweed and I and Beth grew up on the old Bloom's Taxonomy. Now it's Bloom's Revisited. And it's well worth looking at what they're saying about Bloom's. And I believe it's on your sheet. The last thing we want you to do we have just a few minutes. Tweed cut all this butcher paper, so we really want you to use it. What we would like you to do is, is on the butcher paper, just draw as a group or individually what you believe higher ed of the future is going to look like. Draw a picture. A picture, yeah, of what you believe. Well, we want you to like. leave your sheets that you filled out as we've gone along, yeah. and we want you to draw as it, on your table a picture okay. of what higher ed will look like. Will look like, and we will. That would be our next goal. Is our next paper would be to include these in our next paper. So no pressure. No. No. <laughs> but just be artistic. Be. <clears throat> what do you think higher ed will look like? <laughs> Nobody gets out of here until they they've got to leave their pieces, and you got to draw a picture. <laughs> Can I please write you? Yeah. 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 Ye
groups that are reusing these goods that are not going to be used. Yeah, and that could be a great concept. Or the West. Here? I do it here. Oh, he's going to be talking about it. No, he's not. I'm okay. Okay. It's crazy CG. Okay. You want to draw a big cube one? <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe you want to join them in collaboration. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I thought we had to propose doing it over here. Yeah. <laughs>
and your drawings are intriguing <laughs> and, and really these are this is the wisdom of crowds and we all have to evangelize about the higher end of the future because it is not going to be this way it has been this way since World War II after World War II the 50s and we have to change at least according to our scholars researchers and, and certainly our magical bowl here which, which is, is not clear. Which fizzled out. <laughs> uh, uh, different from cloudy, if you notice. Because you have given us clear visions to the future. <laughs> and you're going here, right? No, seriously, this is a conversation. This is not a, a selection of lecture as though we know it. It's the start of a conversation. I, I hope, as you see Rebecca, as you see each other, as you see me, going across campus, as you see your colleagues, You'll continue this conversation because it's a conversation we need to have. And much of those that really, really know me, how deeply this hurts for me to to quote a, a, a liberal member of the administration. You know, and you know me, this this just cuts me right to the throat, right? Ron Emanuel said, "A good crisis is a shame to waste." And I do believe we have we have on our hands a budget problem. And it's a shame to waste that as we think about it. Because yeah. there are changes coming and I think if we if people think and talk about it, we can work our way to a, a, a much stronger higher education program. You know, I I in some ways people think I'm totally nuts because I in some ways really not welcoming the budget problem. That's not the right word. But to the opportunity in, in my last few years to work on these kinds of issues I think is really important. I appreciate Rebecca and Beth uh, giving me the opportunity uh, to, if, if, if trying out my new recipes is the way to do it, <laughs> it's an opportunity to sit and just discuss this and work on these things and ask the important questions. What will higher education and Kansas State look like and be successful in 10 years? When my grandkids 
will come here. Although I have lots of students that went, some that went to. So a couple of thoughts we leave you with. We wanted to share with you about our papers. Our last paper wasn't accepted because they told us it was outdated. <coughs> and he loved it. You know, I'm, I'm crushed. And he thinks it's great. The title was Building Pyramids for the 22nd Century. And it was about converged networks. It was about we should go that way with presidential libraries. We should go that way with, with universities. We should put stuff in the ground that we can remain connected from now and the next, next, next. And it wasn't accepted because they told us we yeah, were way out there. Yeah, mm -hmm. It was old news. Which publisher? Higher Ed. We, we put it to a couple. Higher Ed. So that was that. So that's one thing we want to share well, with you. I was you. tickled to death about that. <laughs> 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 it went all over campus and right <laughs> in the ground. Then the other thing, if you don't think it's possible, this is Singularity U was created last year, you can do one of two things. You can go to the executive program for nine weeks, or you can get a certificate for nine weeks, and you can be entrenched in nanotechnology, biotechnology, and learn from Ray Curzel, some of the gurus in the world about Singularity U. It's pretty fascinating what they've done in two years. For the first nine weeks, they had a thousand applicants for 40 slots. Wouldn't we like to be a part of that? And then the last thing I have to thank Sarah Silva for the handout, all the instructional designers, especially Shasti, for getting us going. Uh, my colleagues, Tweed Ross and Dr. Unger, uh, we'll get her later since she's not here. And of course, Phyllis Epps for the video, etc. And Vicki Clegg, the Center for the Advancement of Teaching and Learning, for sponsoring the roundtable. And, and thank Carlos you. Office for giving us uh, the form. The form. And thank you all for your drawings. Which we will take them. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.